director for the Office of Self-Sufficiency, Claire Seguin, to um, share with us um, why she's excited uh, about today. And then, and then following her remarks, um, we're going to turn it over to um, Lori and, and Juanita, um, if you wouldn't mind um, telling us a little bit about yourselves. Um, so with that, um, Claire. Thanks, Sochi. Hi, Juanita. Hi, Lori. Oh my gosh, have I been waiting for today? I am not kidding. I mean, there are very few things in my job right now that get me this excited. So um, having you here is really a gift and, and we really appreciate your time uh, to come talk with us. You, you can't imagine how perfect the timing is for, um, for our conversation today. And I think for me, I remember when I first discovered this poverty plan and um, I, I loved it for a lot of reasons. I, I really loved it because it was driven by community. I loved it because it had equity front and center just called right out. And it was one of the early documents that I have seen where I really felt like the, the focus on equity was just embedded right out of the, you know, right out of the gate. And I love that. Um, I think your use of data is astounding. Um, I, and I, I want to be Washington when we grow up, when it comes to data. Uh, and I also really appreciated the intentional work around creating a toolkit so that folks across community could be engaged in ongoing support of the work to dismantle poverty in Washington. I, I, I thought the toolkit was brilliant as just a concept and then the way you put it all together, I, I felt like that was so accessible. Um, so all of those things inspired me. And as soon as I got it, I shared it around and we've sent it out to this group. And it's, I know um, a lot of folks have already had a chance to look at it and probably have lots of thoughts. And I, I think we sent some questions in advance. So hopefully that was helpful for you. But um, I just wanted to say that I, I um, am excited to learn. And I appreciate, Lori, when you and I spoke, you mentioned that there were lessons learned, both good and bad. And I think we are a group that appreciates both equally, right? We all recognize the work is not perfect and, and all of that. And so we're, we're really excited to hear all the things um, you learned and want to share as we uh, move forward with sort of bigger hopes and dreams for the work that we're doing. So I guess just with that said, um, I'll turn it over to you all to, to manage the flow. And I think we're all looking forward to conversation as well. Oh, well, thank you so much for the warm welcome. We are so excited to be here. And, um, you, you know, as uh, so she said, I'm Lori Fingst. I'm a senior director with the Department of Social and Health Services. Um, I uh, am honored to be coming to you today from the ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people in Duwamish. Um, we, uh, Juanita and I have been colleagues for quite some time and uh, have been on this journey together. And we are, you know, honored to share. Um, and really, I think we, you know, while we have a presentation that we'll share, um, we really want this to be a dialogue because, you know, uh, we want to learn from you. We we would love to answer any questions. We we love um, everything that you just said. I mean, it really it has been a tremendous journey, um, and I think that there are definitely things that we have done well, um, and there are things that we didn't do well. But as Juanita and I will talk about, um, and even just you know, had to, uh, talked about like it, this last week, I think, is um, the importance of the relationships and the trust of, of what keeps bringing folks back to the table when, you know, you disappoint one another and when you do make mistakes. Um, so we'll, you know, share all, all of that. Um, but for me, it's always an honor to be here um, with Juanita, who is an absolute force of an advocate. Um, she, uh, I don't even know where to begin in, in terms of, um, you know, what Juanita brings to this work. Her and her colleague Drayton Jackson were co-chairs of the steering committee for our work. We'll, we'll go into a lot of detail about um, what they did, but Juanita um, brings so much of her lived experience to this work, so much expertise 
um, around, you know, uh, the, the how people are served by systems. She is an advocate, the board president of the statewide poverty action network in our state. She has been around for a long time. She's she's kind of famous at this point. Um, everybody knows who Juanita is if you work in Washington state government in the health and human services arena. Um, and it's for me, it's um, it's just an honor to be in spaces like this with her um, because if it wasn't for Juanita and her colleagues, we truly would not be where we're at today. So um, she is a dear friend and colleague and Juanita, why don't you um, introduce yourself? Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Juanita Maestas, and I'm the co-chair for the steering committee. And I'm really excited to be here and help guide the way to, um, to this whole thing. I mean, it's hard to put words in it because it's so much. Um, Lori is also a warrior. You know, she's... <laughs> We'll get into it more later also, but she's just amazing too. So I love working with her and I'm so excited to where this is going to lead to. And I hope that um, we can help and any questions and anything you want to know, feel free to ask us. Thank you. Thanks, Juanita. Um... So uh, I did want to circle back, though. Did did you all want to do a round of introductions? I, I think we had plenty of time. So yes, please. Okay. And um, I uh, let's see. <clears throat> Why don't we start with uh, poverty relief task force members? If that if that works for you. May I call on you, Mary? Of course, Sochi. <laughs> Good morning. My name is Mary Lee. I use she or my name. I'm Chinese American. I work for Multnomah County in an office called The Mill, which is the Multnomah Idea Lab. And I am a member of the Poverty Relief Task Force. And I will send it over to uh, Dana. Oh, sorry, Dana, you were just sitting down. That's okay. I was just trying to get the glare behind you. Good morning, uh, Dana Einem. I'm the Social Service Manager for Confederated Tribes of Grand Run. And I will pass it over to, let's see, Claire already did. You could just pick uh, Ashley. It's my mute button here. Oh, can you all hear me? It's telling me I'm muted, that's weird. Okay, <laughs> well, my name is Ashley Marshall and my pronouns are she, her. And I am the Housing Policy Advisor to the Self-Sufficiency Programs at ODHS. And let's see, I will pass it to, um, how about Keith? Good morning. Uh, my name is Keith Falkenberg. I use he, him as my pronouns. I'm the Public Policy Director in the Director's Office of ODHS and happy to be here today. Thank you. Um, let me pass it on to Jana McClellan. Hey Keith, thank you. Jenna McClellan, She, Her Series. I am the Interim Director of the Self-Sufficiency Programs um, for the Department of Human Services and super excited to, uh, to uh, lean in and listen today. And I'll kick it to James. Hello, yes, I'm James Barta. I co-host these Poverty Relief Task Force meetings with Sochi as far as I use the he, him pronoun series. I am also with the Oregon Department of Human Services, our self-sufficiency program doing community engagement. So welcome everyone and all our guests. Uh, and I will uh, turn over to Robin. Robin Maxey. And you're muted, Robin. There's too many buttons here. Uh, I'm Robin Maxey. I am a public information officer at the Oregon Department of Revenue. And uh, Sandra. Thanks, James. Good morning, everyone. Sandra Ponce de Siege, they pronouns. I am the resource access manager at the Oregon Food Bank. And I will pass it to Leanne. Oh, I thought I saw Leanne. 
name's Leanne Marks. I use she, her pronouns. I work with uh, the Oregon Housing and Community Services and we're the CSP group, the program coordinator. I will pass on to Brian. Good morning. Uh, my name is Brian Kirk. I am uh, work for ODHS. I do use he, him pronouns. I'm a manager with uh, Aging and People with Disability. I run programs that uh, around Social Security, uh, especially SSI, including general assistance, state family pre-SSI, and our presumptive Medicaid. And I can pass it on to Donald. Thank you, Brian. Donald Nagel, I use he, him pronouns. I'm a part-time external consultant. Um, and delighted to be part of the journey of this group. And I can pass it to Ethan. Good morning, my name is Ethan Livermore. I use he and him pronouns. I'm a descendant of the Yakima Nation uh, and I am the economic justice organizer for neighborhood partnerships and the organizer for the Oregon Economic Justice Roundtable. Um, I'll pass it over to my colleague, Lauren. I realized that my computer's microphone was actually turned off. Uh, <laughs> my name is Ethan. Uh, I use he and him pronouns. I'm the economic justice organizer over here at Neighborhood Partnerships and the organizer for the Oregon Economic Justice Roundtable. Uh, and I'm a descendant of the Yakima Nation. Thanks. Um, I'll pass it over to my colleague, Lauren. I don't see Lauren in the list. Lauren, are you here on mute? Maybe we could go to Cody while we see if Lauren can join us. Everyone, I'm Cody Trudell, and I am Oregon taxpayer advocate housed within the Department of Revenue. Um, Missy Pizzati, have you gone now? Patty, I couldn't quite hear who you pass it off to, but I will uh, go ahead and ask uh, Linda to introduce herself. Okay, I was not expecting that. Um, my name is Linda McNamara. I work for Neighborhood House. Um, I do the housing and an after school program. And so it's a lot of um, rapid rehousing for homeless folks. So. I'm vigilantly writing down many of your names. So unfortunately you will hear from me in the future, but I'm so happy to be on this call. <laughs> Miguel, I don't, I didn't see if you went, so I was gonna call on you next. Hello, my name is Miguel Mendez, uh, lead policy analyst uh, for self-sufficiency programs for the TANF program. And I see Candy, so Candy. Uh, good morning, I'm Candy Quintal. I am the lead analyst for our self-sufficiency um, employment and training um, programs. And I use she, her pronouns, and I will pass it along to Patty. Good morning, everyone. Patty Unfred, I use she, her pronouns. I'm the chief of strategic planning for the self-sufficiency programs, um, part of Oregon Department of Human Services. And I will pass it to Amber. Hello, uh, Amber Murray. I manage the project management office for self-sufficiency. And I recognize some of your faces. It's great to see some of you all. I was involved with this uh, group when it first began. So I'm excited to be here. And I will pass it to Joanna. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Joanna Wright. I am the change leader for Self-Sufficiency Program Central Office, and we help facilitate the people side of change through the agency. Um, happy to be here this morning. Thank you for the invite. And I will pass to, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, let's see, Steve Van Eck. Hey everyone, I'm Steve Van Eck. I use he, him pronouns. Um, I'm white and I work in the Multnomah Idea Lab in um, the Department of County Human Services at Multnomah County. And um, I'll pass it to Brian Cook if Brian hasn't gone yet. Hi, I'm Brian Cook. I'm the manager of the Self-Sufficiency Training Unit. Use he, him pronouns.
I'm not Allison. sure who to pass it to. Yeah, Allison, uh, I don't think you've gone. All right, hi everybody. I'm Allison Potter. Um, I am with OHA, Maternal Child Health Section of the Public Health Division. Um, I'm really excited to be invited to come today, um, as well as a couple of my colleagues, and I think one of them was on the call. Vanessa, are you on? I'll pass it to you. Hi, my name is Vanessa. I use she, her pronouns, and I am an intern working with Maternal Child Health. And I noticed that our other colleague, Nareet, joined. So Nareet, I'll pass it over to you. Hi, everybody. I'm Nareet Fischler, also with Maternal and Child Health. Also very excited to join you all and learn from Washington State today. Um, I was transitioning between phone and computer, so I'm Sorry, but I'm not sure who else hasn't gone. Uh, we have uh, another Vanessa who's uh, with our team. Go ahead. Oh, I guess we lost her. I'm sorry. Um, uh, Jean. Hi, good morning, Jean Kubik. I work for ODHS as the lead analyst for the SNAP program and I use she, her pronouns. I think Annette hasn't gone. Thank you, Jean. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Annette Palmer with ODHS. I am the TANF program manager and I use she, her pronouns. And I don't know if Hillary's gone. Hi, everyone. I'm Hillary Melbourne. I work with the policy integration team at ODHS. Um, I use she, her pronouns, and I don't know. Am I the last one to go? Oh, there's more. We have, we have Candy, James, you choose. Tina, Candy Quintal, Tina. Oh, Candy went. But, Hi, I'm uh, Christina Gorin, uh, she, her pronouns, and I coordinate the Family Support and Connections Program um, with ODHS. And Jennifer. Hi, my name is Jennifer Parrish Taylor. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Public Policy with the Urban League of Portland. Thanks. And Vanessa, thanks for putting yourself in the chat. Um, and Dila, did you go? Hey everybody, I'm Ann Dilach. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm an employment counselor with Central Oregon Intergovernmental Council, contractor for the jobs program in District 10, Crook Deschutes, Jefferson Counties. Thank you. Did we miss anyone? I suspect we did. Hi everyone, Angela Leet, she, her pronouns. I'm in the Oregon Department of Human Services Director's Office. I'm a public policy advisor. Good morning. And I believe someone just joined or rejoined if you are. Just now joining, will you introduce yourself? Okay. Um, or are you, are you um, okay. wanting me to introduce myself? Yeah, welcome. You, you came Hi. just in time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I, I was just hoping to learn a little something about what the state of Washington is doing about poverty relief. Yeah, your name, please. My name is Ebony. Welcome, Ebony. And um, do, do you mind telling us um, which organization are you with? I work for Multnomah County. Um, I work for the Multnomah Idea Lab. Yay. Is, yeah. mm -hmm. Welcome. OK, yeah, well, last call for um, anyone else to introduce themselves? All right. Well, Hearing none, uh, Lori Juanita, it's back to you. Great, well, thank you so much for going um, through that exercise. I think one, what a great crowd. Um, so, you know, 
we are, like I said, very honored to be here with all of you. I think we also probably have a lot in common given your backgrounds. Um, so again, I can't stress enough that we really want this to be conversational um, and we are you know, ever learning in this space. So always curious to hear from other folks and how you're approaching the work. So what we're going to do, um, we'll give an overview of how of the journey really and that that it's still you know we're still on this journey uh there's still a considerable amount of work to do um you know Juanita and I will will kind of go back and forth we're going to try to weave in some of the questions we received along the way um feel free to interrupt us uh want this to be conversational. Um, we also, I know you received a copy of our latest basic income feasibility study, which was one of the one of the um, outgrowths, I guess, of this work that we recently completed. Um, if there's time, we're happy to answer detailed questions about where we're at with basic income um, and the potential of a state pilot in Washington. Um, but we're really going to focus on, I think, the journey of our work and try to um, just give a flavor for what has been now a multi-year effort and just so much uh, work that's happened. So it's actually really helpful for us to get questions so we can, you know, really, um, I think, be specific around what you're interested in, um, because it's just been a tremendous, tremendous um, labor of love among so many people. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to start kind of from the directive that created what became Governor Inslee's Poverty Reduction Work Group. Um, this was in November of 2017, and Governor Inslee said in Washington State, more than a half million children live in families that struggle to make ends meet, and that is unacceptable anywhere, but especially in a state with so much prosperity. Um, if you just use the measure uh, we we in the beginning um, used below 200% of the federal poverty measure to look at what constituted hardship and what we really should be considering a more realistic measure of poverty. Um, this number has effectively stayed the same if you're just looking at the official measure of poverty. Um, however, there's new measures of poverty. Um, you probably saw data recently that came out um, using the supplemental poverty measure. Um, and when you factor in the role of uh, tax policy as well as uh, safety net policies, um, you actually get to see what your effects are. And in Washington state, um, the study itself said poverty had declined by 59% national, child poverty, I should say, declined by 59% nationally. Um, in Washington, it was 67%. The majority of that decline has occurred um, in the last five years. So while much of that is due to the interplay between st state and federal programs, um, certainly states have considerable decision-making power within that realm. And I am going to say that the work of the 10-year plan that we created and absolutely the work of all of our colleagues has contributed to that acceleration. Um, so when we started this work, a lot of people were like, you know, what are you doing? Bold goals. Um, we'll get more into the specifics of some of what we've done, but there is absolutely a reason to put your stake in the ground and say that poverty is something that um, we not only can reduce, but we could end with our policy choices. And the goal should be beyond that. The goal should be that every child and family has the opportunity to, to really flourish. So, um, you know, this was uh, almost five years ago that uh, Juanita and I came together. This is a little bit of a roadmap of the journey we've been on. Um, and, you know, a lot has happened. I won't be able to go into all of this. Um, but even before Governor Inslee created the poverty reduction work uh, work group, there was an effort in our legislature to create um, a similar work group. And it was introduced in 2016 and it mirrored uh, work that had been done in Utah um, that was really about intergenerational poverty. And at the time, Utah was like ahead of all the states and, and what they were doing. Um, that the following year, uh, so that, that bill didn't pass, the following year, 
Um, another bill was introduced, this time refined, and it basically was creating a task force, a legislative executive task force dedicated to poverty reduction. That didn't pass. The governor was frustrated with those efforts, came out ahead and decided to create the poverty reduction work group. Um, we had that first initial meeting in February of 2018. Um, and we'll talk about some of the decisions in that meeting um, that led to the creation of the steering committee. Um, and then that same session, uh, House Bill 1482 came back and passed. And so then all of a sudden we had two groups that were focused on poverty reduction. Um, and there were some confusion in the beginning about what those two groups did. We have since worked it out and um, while that wasn't planned, it actually worked uh, in our best interest because we have a statutory way to sustain the work beyond everyone um, that is involved right now. Our steering committee was created shortly thereafter, and then everything else kind of flowed from there. Um, multiple groups have formed to take on implementing the 10-year plan. Uh, our state office of equity was created and it's doing their own work aligned with our plan. Um, and then in December of last year, the governor created a sub cabinet of agencies specifically dedicated to implementing the 10 year plan. So this is just like a picture um, of, I mean, literally hundreds of people <laughs> that have come together committed to making sure that what we've put together is more than just words on paper. So we won't have time to talk about all of it, but I did want to give you an idea of just like the journey itself. But when we were first created, um, Governor Inslee was somewhat prescriptive about who needed to be in the room, but we also had a lot of latitude on who was to be in the room. Um, so the directive that he wrote specifically said, you need to have specific agencies. There are 10 involved uh, in uh, the general, the, the full work group. Um, and I'm not sure how Oregon is exactly structured with a lot of this, uh, the services you provide for people experiencing poverty. But in Washington, we spread that across eight to 10 agencies. So uh, we don't have a super agency. Um, we are very much uh, organized by function and funding stream. Um, we had our state racial and ethnic commissions. We uh, had to have tribal and urban Indian representation. Employers needed to be at the table. Uh, lots of community-based organizations. Um, we had think tanks at the table. We had philanthropy. Uh, legislators from both chambers and both parties needed to be at the table. And of course, our advocacy community. So all told, this group was um, 45 people when we first came together. And in that very first meeting, um with just that initial group two things that we decided in the 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 first hour in which we met was how are we going to do our work differently because it's not like we're the first group to ever come together and try to do something related to poverty and they said two things that everyone agreed on and this was not a group that um came together and would necessarily all agree um but they did agree on this one, we needed to center equity, especially racial equity, and center equity in all forms if we were going to be successful. That justice around economic justice was um, essential if we were going to be successful. And then two, we wanted to flip power on its head and we wanted to have people with lived experience in poverty actually leading the work. We felt that their expertise, um, their, you know, their ability to tell us how they experience these issues, what they see as the problems to elevate their solutions was critical to our success. And in fact, the reason why we haven't made as much progress as we would like on these issues. So out of that, our steering committee was born. And that steering committee is a 22 person committee of people experiencing poverty throughout the state. Um, and we met with them. We all met monthly over the course of a two-year period. Um, and we'll, we'll talk a little more about what that looked like. But um, they brought in their experts. They met separately from us. Um, and Juanita and her colleague Drayton Jackson were elected as co-chairs to represent on the general work group. 
and they had experts come in, we had experts come in, we were invited to their table um, after, um, you know, some getting over some initial trust issues, which Juanita um, can, can speak to. And we really were in it together doing the hard work. We would uh, craft recommendations, work with them on what we heard, put it together, um, give it back to them. And that process went on for two years until we finally settled on what would become the 10-year plan to dismantle poverty. So we'll go through that in detail, but I do want to stop here um, and give Juanita the opportunity to talk about the steering committee, um, those initial days of coming together, you know, how it got started and the role that you know, they have played along the way. So Juanita, I'm going to turn it to you uh, to just start anywhere you would like. Good morning, everybody. And um, thank you, Lori, for that. I think for us as a group, as a community that, you know, wants to make that change, this is this is emotional for me, so excuse me if I cry or, you know, get frustrated. Um, when we first started this, uh, we got the steering committee together, and a lot, a lot of things were said like they're not going to listen to us, they're not going to help us. You know, why is this happening? And so. As I was going to, I call it the bigger work group, um, going to their meetings, the first time I went to the meeting, I was scared because here I am, a person that's in poverty with all these bigger people that, you know, I didn't have trust for because they're like, oh yeah, we want to help you, but this is the law. This is the way things go. We can't help you or you're being denied. Um, so going back to the steering committee with this, there was a lot of trust issues. And I think that is one of the biggest hurdles that we had, because we don't want to tell our stories and be tossed to the side after we tell our story with no hope. So we decided to bring in Lori. And this is where the white knight comes in because our first meeting, everybody was like, we don't trust this. You know, how can you guarantee that we're going to be heard? And so I'd say for about a couple of meetings, it was like that. But Lori came to every meeting and stood there and said, I'm here to help tell me so everybody in the picture has a different a different story and the first thing we said is not one solution will take care of everybody's problems and so as the time went on Lori gained the trust of the whole committee and for us, that's a big thing because having at least one person listen to us and, okay, we're going to find a way to fix this. It took a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of tears, a lot of happiness. This is not an easy road for either side, you know, because we work with Lori, but when we take it to the bigger group, how are they going to react? You know, are they going to say, oh, we're not going to do this. This is it. I think for us, we want people to hear us. Because as time goes on, poverty gets worse. And all the policies, all the procedures that are written are way back in the day. They're not changing with the economy. So the old things are here in the present day 
And we got to fix that. Because back in the day, it's fine. Everybody got to go to school. There was no limit. There was nothing. Now there's a limit. And, you know, it's hard to come by. So with all that, you know, we have discussions on, okay, is this policy going to work? How, what is it going to look like? We have disagreements. We have agreements. But you know what? In the end, we always find that link that we both agree on. And that's what makes us stronger. And for me, I've been waiting for this chance for so long to make that change. I have so many colleagues that are just like, we got this, we're going to do this. So when the 10 year plan came out, we were excited. You know, we had to do a couple of touch ups here and there. But in the long run, you have to have compassion. You have to have heart. You have to have trust. And you have to have understanding. Otherwise, it's not going to work. And Lori has been there with us so many times. You know, we've cried together, laughed, smiled. And it's always a pleasure to work with somebody that we know is in our corner. And the group we have now with the bigger work group and the steering committee, we can come together and have a discussion. It may not always go the right way, but there's always that link. You, We find that link and we make it happen. And with this, I can be more honored to be part of this and be a partner with a colleague who has been there. So, my first thing to everybody is go out there and build a trust. It's not going to be overnight. It took us, I don't know, Lori, I don't know how long it took us. It took us a while to yeah. build trust. And here we are. And we want to show people that it can happen and it can work. And it's called coming together and fixing the problems it's and a, go ahead oh no no i f please finish Juanita. i, I want to um circle back to the original timelines we had and how we had to push back to make sure we took the time to do what you're talking about so but please finish i absolutely forgot <laughs> I was gonna oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I totally interrupted you. No, no, it's it's good. Uh, I get this way. I'm still kind of a little nervous. You know, it happens to everybody, I hope. But, you know, this is a long process. And um, I'm going to hand it over to Lori to kind of explain about the process, the timeline with that. Yeah, I um well first of all thank you Juanita. I I you know the trust th that she's talking about was um if we weren't able to build that none of this would have happened. Um and what it looked like early on was you know I was invited into the steering committee meetings and really just sat there and listened um for 5 hours that first time and listen to the stories of how people were treated, the stories of, um, in spite of, you know, so, so many people who were like wanting to move beyond their circumstances, like all the ways in which the system got in the way. And um, at the end of that, you know, I just appreciated everyone sharing. I, I literally just sat there and listened and I asked if I could come back because um, not everybody was happy that I was there. Um, and then I did come back, I was invited back in, and it was another meeting. Um, and, you know, it was after that meeting that I think people realized um, it was another five or six hours of just listening. And um, when I think their initial trust was built that, you know, we were in it to do this differently. Um, 
And, you know, the governor, when he initially put this committee together, mind you, this was November, Thanksgiving week of November 2017, we um, were given eight months to produce a 10 year comprehensive strategic plan to reduce poverty. And I was like, no, we need more time. Um, Cause you know, there are folks in our group, especially a lot of our advocacy partners were like, you can't say that to the governor. And we're like, no, we can absolutely say that to the governor. Like, you know, do you want a document that means nothing or do you want a document that's actually gonna be something that you can use? And we knew enough to be able to say, if we're gonna do this well, we need time. We need time to create the steering committee. We need time to have the conversations. We need time to build the trust. We need time to work through solutions. Like we need time to come together as Juanita was just saying. And so one of the early things we did in addition to you know, building the steering committee was we pushed back and said, if you want a quality pro product, it's gonna take some time. And so um, there are some questions related to the steering committee that we were sent and just to answer a few of them, like are the members of the steering committee volunteers? Um, they are. It was a group that was um, pulled together by Statewide Poverty Action Network, which is a community action partner. Um, however, we were very, uh, we raised philanthropic dollars to make sure that we would pay them for their time. So all of their meeting expenses were covered um, and they received uh, stipends for their work. And that's actually led to a statewide approach that we can talk about later. Um, but we absolutely wanted to compensate them. Um, they put in a considerable amount of time. Uh, they met monthly. They did work in between. Um, now we all meet quarterly now that the work is in implementation phase, but they continue to meet and they've received um, public money to continue playing a role in implementation. Um, yes, they dedicated full days to this work. Um, and uh, there are questions around like, did we use trauma-informed approaches to working with people with lived experience? Absolutely. Um, and you know, maybe when we get more to question and answer um, and discussion, you know, if you have specific questions around that, we're happy to answer. So those are just um, a few of your uh, answers to your questions that were sent to us. Um, I want to talk about how we set the stage for you know, how are we even gonna to begin to craft solutions? Um, we spent a lot of time thinking about you know, how do people typically think about poverty, how people think about people experiencing poverty, um, and are we serious about root causes? Like how far are we going? And we, we pushed each other pretty hard in this respect and the steering committee had a, a pretty pivotal role to play here too, as did a lot of the community organizations, um, community-based organizations that were at the table. So this is what we came up with in terms of the root causes of intergenerational poverty. One, there's history and truth. There's a general failure to recognize and address structural racism, trauma, and discrimination. Our work started before, um, I would say, the, the recent um, just um, awareness around uh, racial dynamics in this country. Our work started before the murder of George Floyd, um, as that was, you know, of course, people were being murdered by police for a long time. Um, and that was a pivotal moment. Um, also, our work was done before COVID-19. So, um, we were talking about this before those events happened. Um, and those events really just illuminated all of the things that we're talking about here. So as we did our work prior to that, it stood the test of time because we were already talking about these issues um, as it related to uh, poverty and injustice in Washington. So failure to recognize and address structural racism, trauma, and discrimination, and just how that manifests in the present day. Um, power and influence, policy and program decisions do not include people who are disproportionately affected by these issues. In fact, our systems have um, outright excluded people from being a part of the decision-making process. Um, there's harmful and inaccurate stereotypes about people experiencing poverty. They're based on falsehoods and, and um, uh, stereotypes and, and assumptions. Um, and the narrative around poverty is discussed as a personal problem 
that if you can't make it in this inherently unjust and inequitable economy, that's on you. That's not a systemic problem. So we identified these as the root causes. And of course, that influences policies, programs, and budgets. Um, those policies and programs, because of these issues, fail to address root causes and are, therefore are insufficient at actually being designed to um, move people out of poverty. They're designed to really manage people's poverty. And that is true at the federal level. And in many ways, that is true at the state level. Um, it doesn't mean that you know, nobody ever succeeds, right? Um, we know people do, but the system was not designed. They, they succeed in spite of the system. And that means that poverty and inequality, um, child, you know, child, adult, and family well-being is undermined by those policies, and it prevents us from reaching our full potential, and it also just reinforces the status quo. So if we were going to be successful in our work, we needed to disrupt these root causes, and this took a while to come together. Um, we also talk about listening. Um, this is how, when we were meeting with the steering committee during that time period that Juanita was talking about, um, we had a ton of data, um, you know, to, to show where our systems were failing. There's a ton of research on, you know, where the shortcomings, like there's, there's not a shortage of information. Um, we also knew that the current state of our human services programs reflected what um, we now refer to as a scarcity mindset. Our programs impose significant costs, the time tax on people when they engage with our systems. So we had all that information, but as you, you all know, um, you know, data doesn't always move the day. Research doesn't always move the day. Um, what is getting the most attention in our state is how our steering committee members articulated what it is like to engage with our systems. So um, I'm just gonna read some of them. And these are these are quotes that I took down in those first few meetings where I was just listening and we have used them throughout. As soon as I take a breath and have a second to just sit and play with my kids on the floor and not worry how I'm going to get dinner on the table tonight or how to pay the rent, the rug gets pulled out from underneath me. It's like a game of shoots and ladders. I climb up just to fall back down repeatedly and getting to the top seems dependent on a lucky roll of the dice. Most of the time I'm like, what's the secret handshake? How do I navigate this to get what I need? Programs don't communicate with one another. I have to tell my story 20 times each time reliving the trauma of it, and it's exhausting. The burden of figuring out the system is on the people served. Once you're in the system, it's a full-time job. I live with a disability and chronic illness. I have a master's degree and I'm attending law school, but I live in my van because my insurance does not cover the basic medical care I need and I cannot afford rent. People ask me, what does being healthy look like to you? And I respond, being healthy basically looks like being rich. So when we talk about the way that the steering committee articulated the problem, um, like, and I'm sure for, well, this is the case with Juanita, when I read these, I see myself in the room and I know exactly who said these things and I see their face and I remember how difficult it was for them to tell their stories. But the fact that we take their stories and are communicating it means the world um, to them. And I do just wanna acknowledge like Juanita said, you know, this is hard. This is people's lives on paper. Um, and that when Juanita and her colleagues show up in these spaces, this is an act of bravery for them. So, you know, as you all do your work and, and um, again, you know, really hoping to learn how you're approaching the work, I think um, it is up to me as a member of an institution that has been dehumanizing to folks to create a culture and a space that is safe for them to be able to share these stories. So Juanita, I want to pause, um, you know, because this is about your colleagues and I'm happy to keep moving on, but, you know, um, you let me know, do you want to comment at all on the role of storytelling um, in the work? Sure. Um, 
I'm kind of teary-eyed read, reading all these because sitting in a room with all these people that have so much going on and being denied and the shoots and ladder story and it's all true it this has to change and the thing that gets me is that our group is recognized by numbers we're not a number we have a heartbeat just like everybody else does we're a human and this work is so important to me and to my colleagues because times are changing and this is where the compassion comes in and you know You know, it takes a really strong person to come in and just have all of these coming at one person. But you know what? She built the trust. She has compassion. And she's helping us make it work. So when you go into trying to design or create you know, how to end poverty, three things, trust, compassion, and always listen. And if you cry, it's okay. Because these, these stories that people live every day is true. And I can't stress that enough. People have asked, you know, um, when we've presented in national conferences, what um you know how did you do this like what like what as if it's like magic and i just i tell folks like i just listened and the biggest thing i did was just believe them that's it you know i i didn't question i didn't judge i didn't um and it's not just me this is like a big group of people like we're here representing a large group of people that built trust together um but you know, when people share their stories and they take that opportunity, um, just believe them. So um, this process that we're talking about, um, that back and forth that we talked about, again, we met monthly, steering committee met monthly, they met before the general work group. The general work group would meet usually a week later, Juanita and her co-chair Drayton would come, they would make sure that what was happening in the steering committee was front and center in our meetings. We had a racial equity consultant who was facilitating the work. We did a lot of racial caucusing in our work. Um, we uh, did just a lot of just grounding in what it what does it mean to do um, equity driven work um, because everybody was starting from a different place. There was a lot of that happening early on in the work. Um, had a wonderful um, uh, person working with us who you know, also experiencing challenges along the way and had a lot to learn from our group as well. So there was trust building all around. Um, as a result of our process, 250 recommendations surfaced and, and we, just, we just cataloged all of them. Um, of course, we knew that that was like a lot of recommendations and we would have to whittle that down. And the way that in which we did that was our group really um, took those recommendations and started to just thematically group them. There was a point in the process um, where we really reached what I call a point of saturation. We kept hearing the same things over and over again, and these themes started to emerge. And so as a result of that, we were able to whittle those 250 recommendations down into eight strategies and 60 recommendations that we felt really addressed those root causes and captured what we were hearing from the steering committee. And so, um, you know, I, I'm happy to share, um, and it sounds like you have the full plan, but the eight strategies were one, um, undo structural racism and historical trauma and take action to undo how they manifest in all policies, programs, and practices. Two was to balance power, that we needed to continue to make equal space and decision-making for people in communities who were most affected by poverty and inequality. So these two, these first two strategies 
really became foundational to the whole plan that if we did not do those two, then we would not succeed in all of the other areas. So they were very deliberately chosen to be one and two. Beyond that, um, Strategy three was to increase economic opportunity through targeted equitable income growth, education, wealth building strategies um, for people with low incomes. Strategy four was to ensure foundational well being and really strengthening health supports across the lifespan to promote the intergenerational well being of families. Um, number five, uh, very much um, influenced by uh, the steering committee, five and six. Prioritize the urgency of the moment, prioritize urgent needs of people experiencing homelessness, mental illness, and addiction. Um, you know, this group was very focused on transformational, ch transformational change and systemic change. And the steering committee was like, you know, that's great. You need to focus on like creating a system that we need. Um, but I'm, I, I'm wondering what I'm gonna feed my family tonight. And I am wondering if I'm going to be able to pay rent next month. So do all that, but you, you have to prioritize the urgency of the moment as well. So maximize everything you've got, you know, while you're also working to build the system you need. So um, strategy five was very important, as was strategy six. You know, build a holistic continuum of care. As I said, we spread services across eight to 10 agencies in Washington. Um, people's lives are not organized that way. You know, the, the poverty is a multidimensional experience, but our systems are designed by bureaucratic function. So we need an integrated human service continuum that addresses the holistic needs of children, adults, and families. We need to decriminalize poverty, uh, reduce reliance on the child welfare, juvenile justice, and criminal justice systems. Um, lots of stories about the interplay. In fact, I would say most of our steering committee members had some experience with at least one, if not more, of these systems. Um, and then prepare for the future of work. Um, we knew uh, that you know, the future of work was going to be disrupted by things like automation and artificial intelligence. Um, and then COVID hit, we know those patterns accelerated. Um, if we were going to create, uh, you know, a workforce that was based in equity um, and could absorb that transition, we needed to be intentional about it. So uh, it's just another example of like, you know, we were already talking about that before COVID hit. And then all of a sudden it was just like all these issues that we thought were years ahead fell into our lap. So those are the eight strategies and 60 recommendations. And the goal of our work is to build a just and equitable future in which all Washingtonians live with the dignity of having their foundational needs met and the opportunities they need to reach their full potential in life. Um, if you're familiar with Raj Chetty, um, you know he is of course a superstar in um, the data world related to economic mobility and stability. Um, he was part of an effort at the Urban Institute that really, you know, thought about what does it mean to be successful and move beyond poverty? And economic success is certainly a part of that. Um, equally important is power and autonomy and self-determination. And I would say um, possibly more important than all of it is the feeling of belonging. The feeling that, you know, you, you are, because you're a human being, um, you have the dignity of having your foundational needs met. And that should be disconnected from whether or not you can prove your worth through work. Um, so uh, that framework very much, you know, informs like, what are we actually trying to achieve here? Because yes, it's about economic stability, but it's about so much more. So um, we submitted this plan in January of 2021. Um, we actually had a draft that we were starting to work with stakeholders and just like get feedback on right when COVID hit. And as I said, I, we were very nervous that as people geared up for the emergency response to COVID, that they were to get, forget about this work. Happily, that did not happen because COVID just illuminated everything that was there. And it actually made the case for our work in a way that we did not anticipate. And we took every advantage of that. 
Um, so we were able to reframe and reposition our work based on the feedback from stakeholders that this isn't just a 10 year plan to dismantle poverty. This is a blueprint for what a just and equitable future could look like on the other side of where we're at right now. So um, we did a pretty significant engagement with community across the state, all virtual. Um, and then we submitted this in January of 2021 to the governor. 25 recommendations were immediately acted upon in that 2021 legislative session. Last legislative session, $1 billion was invested in poverty reduction and homelessness. Um, a lot of that money was a mix of so federal relief funds related to COVID and going into the affordable housing crisis that we have. Um, and also uh, a lot of specific uh, resources dedicated to shoring up some of our um, uh, programs that we could traditionally think of as serving people in poverty and also sustaining some of the investments we made during COVID. Um, we've been recognized as a national best practice through uh, the American Public Human Services Association, as well as uh, the Aspen Institute. And like I said, the governor created to specifically implement the plan. Now that we have it, we need accountability. So he created a sub cabinet on intergenerational poverty. There are five agencies that are leading that, but we still work with the 10 that were involved in the creation of the 10 year plan. And they have used the 10 year plan during our current budget and policy cycle. And we just submitted this week, um, all the agencies submitted their request legislation um, and uh, budget requests for the biennial budget build for next year. And there are over 30 proposals across those 10 agencies related to the 10 year plan. So this was not just words on paper. You know, this was very much rooted in action. The sub cabinet is relatively new and the work is evolving now. We, we created a plan. The steering committee was very clear. This, this has to be action now. We have a plan. Don't just let it sit there. So the sub cabinet, um, you know, that top paragraph was, was created through executive order. Um, you know, it basically says like you are to implement the 10 year plan. Our immediate focus is on integrated eligibility, affordable housing and eliminating gaps and cliffs in our programs. So a lot of what we're gonna be putting forward is related to that. Um, we have a call to action that every agency has agreed to, and that is to work collectively toward that just and equitable future by measurably reducing poverty and inequality with integrity, intention, and accountability to people and communities who have been historically excluded from well being. Juanita and her colleagues um, are still very much a part of this space, and they are um, you know, still at the center of the work. Our priorities for 2023 that are organizing those 30 requests that I just mentioned, let's just make navigating health and human services easy. Let's increase food and housing stability for Washingtonians because it saves money and it saves lives. Invest in the generational well being of families by um, investing in ample affordable housing and childcare. Um, and also, I should change this and living wage jobs so that we can pass health, wealth, and well-being from one generation to the next. And let's strengthen community's ability to partner in solutions. And that was very much influenced by the role the steering committee played and us wanting to codify that in the state's approach to budget and policy across the board. I want to end um, with this quote from Juanita and her co-chairs, um, because it really is the heart of the work. And then, you know, really just want to open it up to questions and discussion and are at the time we have left together. This is what we led with when we first released the 10 year plan, and it still holds today. Um, and Juanita, I'll read it and then I'll give you an opportunity to give the, the final word before we go to Q&A. Um, but this to me is really what when we re read this to legislators, when we read it to the governor, when um, we take it everywhere we go, national forums, this is what people um, feel inspired by. So trust is something that comes hard for many of us and a plan without action is just a plan. 
We wholeheartedly want to believe that the time and energy we invested in this effort will result in the policy and program changes so desperately needed for our children, families, and communities, but remain concerned that the politics of privilege and privilege will trump the bold steps needed for more Washingtonians to achieve the independence, self-determination, and economic success that can be shared with our children and grandchildren. We are deeply grateful to Governor Inslee for taking a stand on poverty and inequality. For those of you with the power to now decide whether and how to act, please remember that millions of Washingtonians just like us will continue to struggle to keep a roof over our head, struggle to feed our children, and live without peace of mind that things will be okay. Please don't forget that we are the people behind the numbers, the lives that will benefit should you choose to act. Go ahead, Juanita. Um, I have one very important thing to say. With all of this, you know, it can be frustrating. It can be happy. It can be motivating. But if there is a situation where you disagree or you hear something and it doesn't sound right to you, do not walk away. Please remember to open the communication lines. And if you don't understand what was said or you are hurt by what was said, please open that communication up and ask, you know, can you explain what, what the comment was? Um, please, you know, walk through this with compassion. I cannot say that enough. Right now, when I walk into the bigger work group, I feel welcomed because I know I will be heard. When I take it back to the steering committee and they're just like, what, what happened? What went on? I can sit there and honestly tell them, okay, this is where we're at. You know, this went forward. Now let's work on the next step. Let's do the communication. Communication is just a must also. So add that to my list of things that you got to walk into this with. And, you know, being a person that has gone through all of this, you know, it, it's a blessing to hear all of this. And I'm so excited to hear that people are interested in what we're doing. Finally, we get to be heard. And thank you for everybody that's stepping up and taking that and running with it and trying to figure out ways to make it livable for us so you know I love this I'm not <laughs> a good public speaker but I speak with my heart and truth and you know it, it's not easy so when you run with this remember communication trust compassion and always listen and always listen to the feedback because it's very important as we take feedback and we listen to it. And remember, find that missing link and put it in there. You know, and sometimes I'm not, sometimes I feel like I'm in the Wizard of Oz. I want to be that bridge that connects with the government part and then with the steering committee community i want to be that bridge that you can walk on and do it with everybody so my words of wisdom i think but <laughs> let's move forward thank you juanita and thank you to everyone for just letting us share um, the work and I think we've probably done enough talking and um, we'll turn it back to you if you have questions or comments or share what you're doing you know um, let's open it up well exactly and thank you so much for this presentation is a lot 
to absorb. I know there's, I need to be reading some more, but I'm sure we have questions. And as people think about their questions, there is the traditional one in the chat. It, will we get the slides? Oh yes, of course. <laughs> yeah, we're happy to, we're happy to share all the materials, which, you know, we do have a website that's, um, we're actually in our big rebranding phase right now where um, because the work has evolved and so we're we're hoping to upgrade all of our stuff as um, you know so we're happy to share a bunch of new materials great thank you and so i'll ask everyone you can raise your hand or put something in the chat claire Surprise, it's me. I've got a million questions. Um, you know, I what I really find um, interesting about this all is the way that you have worked through um, sort of the role of the governor, clearly pivotal in a lot of ways, and you have the incredible value of your steering committee and you have the essential partnership with the state agencies all beautifully blended it seems into this work and i um i guess i just wanted to acknowledge that that seems like a herculean task to me to get all of that sort of figured out because i think uh, i'll speak for myself i know i struggle with how to hear the need and then put it through our structures, right? Because our structures are kind of messed up about really hearing the need. I mean, to all the the quotes that you shared and Juanita's point, you know, we're just looking at it from a different lens. And I, I don't know if there's a real question here, except to say, you know, how did you make that work without um, sort of letting our bureaucracy um, impede all the process of the of the hearing of the voices, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think some of it was we had some things working in our favor. Um, so there's a, a little bit of serendipity in there. I'm going to say mostly, though, it is like I think when we all talk, when we've talked about this work, like like systemic change, right, it conjures up like machinery, right? Like the system is just churning and I've, I'm guilty of using that metaphor. Um, you know, and really what the system is, is people making decisions. And the entirety of our job is, you know, that we need to help people in positions of power make different decisions and disrupt that status quo. And we are not shy about it. Um, we're smart about it. You know, like if you, I mean, I've been doing this work for a long time. I've got, you know, if you want data, I can give you data. If you want research, you know, yeah, we've got research. We've got the voice of people most affected. You know, we are prepared um, when we've shown up to make the case for why, if you were to do this work and be successful, you will start to see the outcomes you want in education and health and workforce development in um, criminal justice and child welfare. Like in, name any system that you care about, you will make more progress if you do this work. But, you know, so, we chose to do our work in a certain way. It just so happens that all the research backs up what our steering committee is saying, right? So if people are gonna show up um, in those spaces, we have encouraged folks to be bold. You know, I'm not, I'm not giving you anything that's not fact. And if you, if you wanna challenge my facts then bring your own and we can have that conversation, but you better be prepared because we have done our homework. And so um, when we did have to, you know, work with legislators, with the governor, it may look like it's beautifully blended. Um, I call it a beautiful mess because it's messy and it involves conversations and the continual like just pounding of the pavement. Um, and the fact is this poverty is in every single community in the state and people um, who have been historically excluded, um, indigenous black and brown Washingtonians, people in the LGBTQ community, people with disabilities, immigrants and refugees, people in rural communities have been hit first and worst by these conditions. But the fact is they undermine us all. And when you can connect it to every single legislator's district, you know, it's like, this is a problem that we all need to face together. So when we, we have so many people that are able to use their voice um, 
to bring it all together, you know? Um, and then I'll, I can talk more about the legislative executive task force too, because that's that's played a, a pivotal role. And I think I see a question in the chat about that. So we'll come back to that. Um, but Ethan, um, I see you have your hand up. I hope I answered yeah. your question, Claire. Okay. Yeah, it's it's funny. I Right before I press the button to put my hand up, Jennifer, I think, worded my question in a much better way. Uh, so I, I think I'll just seed my question into to Jennifer's question about um, what was the response to uh, legislation that centers equity? Because here in Oregon, we have a lot of, of different divisions politically. So I'm, I'm very interested more specifically in, in, in answer to Jennifer's question. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's interesting because I'm sure it's like funny that we probably get the same response when you all go to national conferences. Everyone thinks like Oregon and Washington are like this, like, I don't know, progressive, like homeland or something. And I'm like, actually, that's not the case at all. Like, I, you know, we, for a long time, our, our legislature was like razor thin margins on either side. It was divided for a long time. We, um, we are seemingly like a much more purple state, I think, than like a, a blue state, but the perception is so different. So it sounds like Oregon is very similar. Um, so, uh, you know, a couple things. I mentioned strategies one and two as being foundational to the whole thing. And this is where I think some serendipity happened. While we were doing our work, there was a, a council working on health disparities and we aligned with them quite closely because really, if you're talking about social determinants of health and everything we're talking about here, we're talking about the same stuff. So um, we made that alignment right away. They recommended the creation of the state office of equity. And we very much got behind that. It's specifically in our recommendations to say like that office should be created and they should be working in um, very specific ways to ensure equity is at the heart of everything that the state is doing. And that's happened. So the legislature created the Office of Equity. That was a few years ago. Um, I believe that uh, Dr. J, who is in that role, was hired in the middle of 2021. Um, and they created, and again, this is a statutorily created group, so you can't get rid of them. Um, they created what they call the PAIR Plan and Playbook. And that stands for the Pro-Equity Anti-Racism Plan and Playbook. That used a lot of the 10-year plan that we talked about here to build the model that they mandate agencies to do their work now in a way um, that is intended to achieve equity. So that covers so much, how we contract, how we hire. Um, there are pair teams throughout the agencies this year for our budget and policy requests you had to answer an equity impact assessment to even get your budget and policy requests into the mix for consideration in the governor's budget. So the legislature required the state to do this work. Um, that said, you know, that's the makeup of our legislature right now and is a reflection of who happens to be in power. Um, I mean, Washington, like all states and the nation is, you know, um, not everyone is on the same page with that. So we continue to make the argument that um, if you invest in equity, like that benefits everyone. It benefits everyone in well-being and it benefits everyone. If you care about money, I mean, you know, if it's all about the green to you, then we can make that case too. You know, so we just don't shy away from it. We continue to use data and research and have people who experience these issues right there. Um, you start to see that it's much harder to judge somebody when they're just sitting right in front of you, right? So we employ all the tools um, to try to, you know, make sure that we don't lose sight. We, we won't be successful unless we do this in a way that achieves equity. But yes, there's a lot of pushback, but just uh, I'm not going to shy away from those conversations.
Um, Ashley, so I'm reading the chat. Um, I was wondering how you were able to shift power in decision making. What happened when the powers that be disagreed or weren't willing to move forward bold recommend recommendations from the community was research enough to build consensus? I'd say like Juanita's chuckling. Um, <laughs> so Juanita, why don't you start on this one? Um, where do I begin? <laughs> I know. Um, time and understanding and going so far in depth. Um, a lot of explaining from one side, a lot of explaining from the other side. And, you know, it could be one meeting, two meetings, or even chats in between the meetings to try and come up with something that you can put in the middle that will have both both sides agree um in these conversations you know frustration is a big thing because somebody has an idea well maybe that won't work or somebody has an idea yeah this will work but I guess from both sides of the bigger work group and the steering committee, you know, it's always more than just one conversation. It's multiple conversations to get to that point. And I don't know how many times I get frustrated and I call Lori, what does this mean? Or I'll call Marcy and say, what does that mean? Tell me and in terms that I would understand. And a lot of times people go, well, like steering committee will come into a conversation that we don't understand what the meaning of um, trying to fix something. It's a language thing. Mm -hmm. And I kind of laugh because I'm like, I need an interpreter because I don't understand what is being said. And that's one thing about the bigger work group. When you say that, there's always people saying, okay, this is what it means. And, you know, it's not just one idea that you get. You get so many ideas and it makes it so much easier to find that solution to make it work. So I think that frustration comes to mind first. And then, you know, that's when everybody puts stuff on the plate. Okay, hey, yeah, we could use a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And we find the perfect link. I hope I said that. Yeah, no, Bonita, that's great. I, you know, there are definitely, there were naysayers like along the way and people who still held those like false assumptions. Um, and really, you know, there was a lot of conversation behind the scenes, like to try to explain why something needed to happen, where somebody was coming from. Then you have the people who are like, well, that's never going to happen, or that's not my job, you know? And it, it's like, you are a leader in this moment in time, in this space, and you signed up to be a part of this work. The governor is telling you too, that you need to be a part of it. So um, I think everyone was there willingly, but you know, I guess for some folks, maybe they felt all and told, I don't know. Um, but, you know, we just spent an inordinate amount of time, you know, working with folks to build that shared understanding that Juanita is talking about. And a lot of that was one-on-ones in between meetings. Um, and I would say that at the end, not the vast majority of folks came along. And when you talk to leaders who are in this space that we really had to spend a lot of time with, there is a lot of humility. People will say like, this is the most challenging, the most humbling thing I've been a part of and truly like the most joyful thing because we did the work differently. That said, not everybody came along at the end. And that was, you know, we did our job. We had the hard conversations. For folks who didn't want to be there, um, we're like, you know, that's okay. We gave everyone the opportunity to write letters of support for the work or dissent. Nobody dissented. Not everyone showed up in support, but nobody got in the way. 
Juanita, go ahead. And also another thing to remember is that to this day, through all of this, you know, you get to know your community. You get to know the members. And that's what drives it too, because I know the bigger work group, bigger work group knows the steering committee. And it's a nice feeling because when you go into a conversation, yeah, I know this person. I know what this person is asking. And I'm not saying it makes it so much easier that you can just go forward but you, it makes it easier to understand and know what's at play right now. So, you know, get to know your community members. If you're going to do this, you know, say, just look at what they've been through. Yeah. And, and I would also say that there was, there was like a boldness of people who operate in this space that are in positions like mine, um, you know, and, and the advocacy community that, that Juanita is a part of, where for me to show up in these spaces and be authentic and accountable to Juanita and her colleagues, you know, that means sometimes stepping out of my lane um, and being very clear on where I stand, right? And so like a perfect example of, of one way, um, there were like a, a handful of folks, one of which at the end said they could not get behind the plan because they didn't think that race was a, a factor in poverty. And they just couldn't put their organization out there and say that. This is, you know, after COVID, after, you know, the, the murder of George Floyd after all of it. And I said, okay, if I, I get that you are saying that, I'm like, I invite you to tell everyone why. If that's the reason, go ahead, put it out there. And, you know, that's your perspective and that's fine. But, you know, I invite you to say that and put it out in the world. And do you think that they did? No. So if there's a point where like, you know, we can't see eye to eye on something that is so clearly connected by data and research and the stories and all of it, right? Policy, you can link, there's, there's volumes in the library, right? Dedicated, every library in this country has volumes dedicated to these issues. If that's not enough for you to see those linkages, like I'm not gonna be able to, you know, present that to you. But I invite you to make your case in a public forum and we can talk about it. You know, and that's one way it's like, I'm not going to fight with you anymore. But I, um, if you want to continue to have that discussion, then we can have that. So that's like one example, I think, of how you put yourself on the line, you know. Um, and I'm, I'm not like, I'm not a hero. Like, I mean, these, th there were moments along the way where things got messy and ugly and, you know, I made mistakes. We all made mistakes. Um, but like Juanita said, we had the trust to come back and say like, hey, you didn't get this right. Or um, I'm not happy with this. And we had the trust to work through it for the most part. And Linda has a question in the chat as well. Um, did you spend time reviewing what Utah did to reduce poverty before you creating the, yeah. Um, trying to see if Oregon can learn from or emulate this plan. Yeah, um, so interestingly, Oregon, I'm sorry, Utah, um, Utah's effort was run by a woman named Tracy Gruber, who I believe is now the director of the human services um, department. I forget what they're called. And I think they have human services and workforce development in the same um, unit. So anyway, Tracy is amazing. Um, they focused early on uh, very much on data. They wanted, uh, they just wanted to be able to track intergenerational poverty and they let the data really speak to what needed to happen. Utah at the time was probably the reddest state in the nation, and they were doing the boldest work on poverty. 
um, and really starting to see some early results from that work. And Tracy is like this tremendous resource who talks so eloquently about poverty should not be a, a, like a partisan issue. It is a bipartisan issue. And they proved that when you, like the way in which they talk about poverty in Utah really made such a difference. So what they did was um, they were innovative in how they measured intergenerational poverty. And then they helped agencies basically write, you know, um, budget and policy requests to change those numbers. And I haven't tracked it in a while, but um, I believe they issued reports every year. On the data side, it's definitely worth looking at what they did. We replicated their work in Washington. Um, so in Washington, like adults who are on food assistance, 46% of adults on food assistance today were on food assistance as kids. So we were able to longitudinally replicate what, what Utah did in that respect. Theirs is much more detailed. I would say we wove that in and we took it a step further. And we, you know, every state I think in their approach is gonna be different just based upon the unique circumstances, the culture of your state, the demographic makeup of your state, who is experiencing poverty more than others. Um, it'll all look a little bit different, but absolutely their work is something to, to you know, learn from. And I'm sure if you reached out to Tracy, she'd be happy to talk about their work. Other questions? Well, I, I have a question oh. for all of you. Well, I'm really curious, like where you're all at in your journey. Early is a good answer. Uh, a little disorganized. Um, I'm wondering, Claire, do you, do you want to uh, speak to where you feel? No. Um, I could, but I would love to hear where others think we are, honestly. Yeah, I, I, I think like one of the things, because I, you know, Claire, you said this earlier, like it, I think as we talk about it, it, it looks like now, right, there were five years in, now it looks like all kind of polished maybe or, but I guess I, I just um, can't stress enough some of what like Juanita was talking about earlier. This was like, so it just messy. It was so messy and it had to be, it had to be. So if you're, if you're feeling disorganized or overwhelmed or like just start somewhere, you know, like dig in, center people with lived experience, but just like there's no right answer to doing the work. I we've stressed that in national forums when we get questions like I, I, there's no one recipe. And so if you're early in the journey, like do not be overwhelmed um, by you know the work because you probably already know a lot of what needs to happen. Ethan? Yeah, I I have like a million different questions in my head. So maybe I'll just have to send you an email later on uh, and, and pick your brain for really however long you, you think you can stomach so many questions. But I think one one that's a special a, a question that I have, um, folks in Oregon were really starting to identify and begin to strategize around creating new narratives around economic justice. And it, it was really, uh, really interesting to see that you that you all included narrative, um, just the presence of narratives as a, a cause of generational poverty. And I'm curious to hear uh, kind of how that narrative piece developed in either creating this 10 year plan um, or just sort of how narrative continues to come up in your work to dismantle poverty. That's such a great question. And I'm so glad you asked it because we just created a fact sheet um, for this work that we're going to be using in the upcoming legislative session. We've been very intentional around narrative, and I think there are some amazing practitioners out there that we've learned from. 
One of them is a gentleman named Trabion Shorters. Um, he is in New York and the name of his organization is called Be Me. It's capital letter B M E. He's doing work specifically with the black community, but the lessons from his work just permeate. Um, his whole thing is like how to tell an asset. He talks about the brain science of how we take in information and the flaws with like some of our narratives to achieve justice work against the outcomes we want because we lead with the problem rather than like leading with the fact that, you know, people are the greatest asset that we have. And he talks about like um, in the black community, like the things that you don't know, like they enroll in the military at a higher rate. They are, you know, father, black fathers are spend way more time with their children. Like the data that we use to tell stories do not reflect the assets that all of, you know, our folks bring. So we took that to heart and are trying to take that approach. Um, Rinku Sen, who started Race Forward, now has the Narrative Initiative Project, and she's got some great toolkits out there for like to really build that strengths-based narrative. And we're doing that in, like as a big group of folks. So we put together some fact sheets and some talking points as we're going into next session, and we're all going to come together as a group and kind of. Like, how is this sitting? Are we are we meeting the mark? Are we, you know, it's an imperfect science communications, but I think what Trabion's message is like, you have to sh start with the stories about people that make them worthy of investment, right? And he's got some online tutorials that are just fantastic. So as we kind of finalize that stuff, we can share it with you. Um, I'm sure it's not going to be like perfect, or do I think that's ultimately going to be the only the, the thing that carries the day? Probably not. I think it's that combined with Juanita and her colleagues coming in with us talking about those issues. Like, you know, it's it's all the tools in your toolkit, and that's a really a, such an important one. So we'll share as we, yeah. Um, Claire, I saw you. Um, if there's no other questions, I can. I do have. I can talk briefly about the basic income work, um, if you think it's a good time. Yeah. Well, I have one quick question before you do that. Is uh, I know you mentioned the compensating community for their work, and that is you know necessary, but of course not sufficient. You know, just building trust. But just a small question is, how do you avoid? Um, costing people some of their other benefits in that compensation. Oh yeah, we could talk about this for a long time. So um, yeah, so as one of the, I mentioned the 25 recommendations that were immediately acted upon. Um, so last year, uh, Senate, Bill, Senate Bill 5793 passed um, it basically set a compensation, the expectation that you will compensate what are called class one groups, which is definitely like the, the a steering committee. It's class one groups are people who are doing this work outside of the course of their normal job um, in the way that like Juanita and her colleagues are um, working. And it set the expectation that they are to be compensated for their expertise. Um, it set uh, basically an expectation that they will be adequately compensated and that new office of equity was to issue the final guidelines of what it means to value people for their time and an equi uh, equitable pay structure. So they issued interim guidelines um, and those guidelines are $45 an hour um, up to a cap of $200 per day. There's some legal issues related to when somebody starts to um, become an employee and we had to be like within the labor laws around that. So that's where the cap comes in. Also a part of the legislation, and I can send you the language, was that agencies were to do everything in their power to the greatest extent possible within federal and state, within federal law um, to protect that compensation from benefits. So what that meant was at the state level for things that are within our control, 
we've had to take steps to protect that compensation from benefits. At the federal level, as I'm sure you all know, it gets trickier, but what it's done is forced a conversation with federal agencies on trying to protect benefits um, in this way. So there's a layer of federal advocacy that has opened up as a result of the language that was included in that bill. So we're happy to share the bill, um, but mostly like Juanita um, and her colleagues, you know, they decide how they participate. Like Juanita will get paid for her participation today. You know, um, they decide how they participate and we, you know, they are aware of how these things affect their benefits and we let them make a decision based upon what's best for them and their family. Um, so Juanita, I don't know if you wanna add anything to that because you all have talked about that quite a bit in the steering committee. Um, all I know is, <laughs> I don't pay attention, um, is that I guess our limit is 600. You can do like gift cards and you can do stipends, but I think most of us use gift cards unless it's something um, different. But I know our limit is 600. That way it doesn't go into the benefits or taking out of whatever benefits that we're on. Um, good example, me, I'm on disability. So I have to be at that limit. Otherwise they'll start taken out of my disability. So yeah. there is a limit. Yeah, and counting the income as a gift gets you out of certain things. Um, so that's part of why they chose that route. What we're trying to do is open up the case that like, if we're gonna call like that pair plan I talked about requires the agencies to engage with people with lived experience to do our work. So if we're gonna require that, we need to pay them for the expertise that they have and not leave them worse off as a result. So we haven't figured all of it out, but it is a very active conversation right now. And for people who aren't tracking the chat, Linda posted a link to the bill. Oh, thanks, Linda. And Lori, there is quite a bit of interest in the basic income. I feel like that people almost could have a whole nother call on that. Many people in this group um, you know, have, have had discussions about recommendations and where to go. And there was actually an effort that you may have heard about from Claire to, to drive forward some, some efforts there. So any learnings you can have there um, that people can ask questions for in this final couple of minutes, I think would be of interest. Yeah, so um, I will be quick because I know we are almost at time and we stand between you and your lunch. Um, but, you know, this was very basic income was talked about at length in our 10 year plan. So we connect it directly back to that, the role of direct cash, um, you know, and unrestricted nature of it is something that, um, you know, there's a huge push for it around the country. Um, we spend a lot of time, like I said, talking about data. We have, we have data, we used a tool from the Atlanta Fed to really drive this conversation. We go back to that, um, how our steering committee experiences the problem. Um, we talk about basic income research. This is the proviso that required us to do a basic income feasibility study. Um, I'm happy to send this presentation. Um, we also created a steering committee to create the basic income feasibility study. And because of our experience with our steering committee, we have gotten better at ba basically making sure that the people who stand to benefit the most from our like um, policy program and funding decisions are included. So, you know, this is just to show you the diversity of people that came together, a lot of gender diversity, sexual orientation, race, ethnicity, on all of these areas. We were very intentional about cultivating the group. And that is a direct outcome of what the steering committee showed us, that that is absolutely the way to do the work. Um, they helped define the vision for basic income. We go through all this stuff, but basically the recommendations that we came up with um, were to do a guaranteed income pilot for Washington State, do that through public-private collaboration between the state, tribes, and community partners. Um, we recommended a two-year pilot 
with a targeted universal approach. Um, group one is basically um, people experiencing poverty below 100% of the federal poverty level with no or low employment. I consider that really deep poverty. And group two is low income with employment between 100 and 200%. There's a lot of reasons for those two groups that I don't really have time to explain, um, and, but happy to in a follow-up. Targeted to nine priority populations with destabilizing transitions or circumstances. Um, again, that very targeted approach and each group would have a control group. We tied the basic income amount or guaranteed income amount to a percentage of fair market rent. And we provided estimates um, at 75, 100 and 120% of fair market rent for sample sizes of 5,000, 7,500 and 10,000. So that looks like on the low end, uh, $587 a month in the least expensive county, which is Garfield, and $2,400 a month, a little over $2,400 a month for the most expensive county at the highest basic income amount. So that's the range. We did cost estimates for all of that. Um, we actually like outlined how that all came together. This is what the pilot ultimately looks like. And these are the destabilizing conditions pregnancy, homelessness, a recent immigrant refugee or asylee, exit from foster care, juvenile or criminal justice, uh, criminal justice, sorry, um, and escaping a violent situation, a person with a disability and a behavioral illness um, that is work limiting. And then we divvied it up by um, our managed care regions. Um, and this is how the pilot would operate. And we would evaluate them on those three areas of well-being that were in our this, the previous presentation. Um, you know, how did this affect economic status, power and autonomy and sense of belonging? Um, so, you know, we have it all costed out and cost benefit evaluation. It's all in the study. Um, right now we have a champion in the legislature. Representative Liz Berry is um, basically, uh, you know, leading the effort to create a bill that would bring the state level pilot to fruition. There's a big stakeholder group and coalition. Um, our steering committee is still involved in the implementation of it. And we'll see what happens. You know, um, a lot of that is up to the legislature, but I'm happy to share, you know, more in a follow-up call um, and more materials if that would be helpful. I'm just amazed how quickly the time went by. Uh, Me too. Thank you so much for sharing your work. Yeah, I I just want to, I mean, it's always an honor when people ask. Um, we're really proud of the work and, you know, it. Um, there are so many people that Juanita and I are representing today, so I don't want to give the impression that it's just the two of us. Like, hundreds of people are involved in this right now, and it is because of them, so... Thank you for your time and really want to hear where you all go. Um, and Juanita, I, why don't you close us out? Um, I want to say thank you for this opportunity and sharing um, what we're doing. And it makes me feel really happy that there's other states that care about their community. So, you know, good, good luck. Um, I'm anxious to see where it goes um and this is an honor and i will take it back to the steering committee and be in awe <laughs> um thank you everybody well we will share our work with you and we hope, look forward to hearing your updates and being in contact so Thank you everyone for coming today and uh, wish you a good Friday. Have a great weekend, everyone. Take care, everybody. Bye.